this roll of papers right here on the edge of the desk. Okay. You know, this business of cleaning up this place, it really is a week's job. I know. I think we've got everything up to the 1930s cleared away now. You know, you really do have a, a large collection of pictures for 1930 and 1940. What in the world is this thing? Oh, look, oh. Howard, an NRA flag. Yes. National Recovery Administration. Mm -hmm. See that blue eagle? Remember when you saw that eagle on everything from shirts to flower sacks? <laughs> well, am I to assume that you were about to unreal vast storehouses of knowledge on the subject? <laughs> well, uh, you just make it a few small... You get a straight A. And if you wish to carry the recitation a little further, you might say that the NRA eventually became too heavy a yoke for business and that it subsequently failed. But yes. it was a good reform measure anyway. <laughs> you know, how this was only the starter of uh, a lot of government agencies. Do you remember the WPA and the PWA? Yes, and the FHA and the <laughs> AAA. And, and the CCC and the FERA. And the USHA and, the, uh, <laughs> um, and so on and so forth. Oh, now don't tell me you've run out of initials. Well, a little more time and I can think of a lot of them. But just the same, those agencies did a lot to help the nation get back on its feet. Mm, yes, well, the nation got back on its feet. <laughs> You're still waiting through this pile of stuff. Say, what do you uh, say that we organize an agency? Agency? Mm -hmm. Us here? Mm -hmm. What, for instance? Well, now, let me think. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, we could call it the E-W-U uh, and H-W-D. Uh, H-W-D. Mm -hmm. Don't get it. No, dear, mm. I don't think you ever would. It stands for Esther works upstairs and Howard works downstairs. Very, very <laughs> subtle. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. I detect a subtle hint there, too, that I should get back to work. Well, right you are, dear. And you make that work administration progressive. Oh, definitely. That would be the, the WAP, Work Administration Progressive. We shall progress. Mm -hmm. I think you need a rest. Why don't you sit down, dear, and look at a book? Oh, here, now, here. Here's the very one for your book on architecture. Well, say, now that might have some sketches of the uh, government housing project in it. Mm, yes, it, it well might, but, you know, there's one project in this house. Well, back to architecture, the 1930s. You know, let's take a look at what the scene, 1929. You see the influence of the great bull market was still being felt. In 1931, saw completion of the tallest of all skyscrapers, the Empire State Building. And just uptown a few blocks, the impressive structures of the Rockefeller Center could be seen. The buildings house ornate radio, television, and movie halls, as well as business enterprises. Very interesting picture. But the city presents other pictures. Slum, blighted areas, 850 million families shared their homes with other families. Juvenile delinquency increased. Disease and sickness prevailed. Prosperity ground to a dead stop. President Roosevelt announced one-third of the nation is ill-fed, ill-clothed, and ill-housed. Then, for the first time in history, the government undertook a program of slum clearance, low-cost housing, in order to provide decent living conditions for all. The Public Works Administration was organized in 1933, and projects for rebuilding the slum areas, erecting new buildings, stimulating heavy industry were started. Decent homes with light, air, and space were soon seen to replace the unsanitary buildings of the city shafts all under the supervision of the U.S. Housing Authority. In Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, a building is constructed through the PWA. At a high school, 
in San Francisco is modernized. Another high school is constructed in Pocatello, Idaho. And so under federal leadership, architects once again found place in planning for the adequate housing of the people of America. And the Americans developed some new tastes in housing in the 1930s. Common sense seemed to be the keynote. Simple, clean lines and a lot of space, sunshine and sanitation were the things that were prized. And glass bricks and, in general, more glass areas were part of the trend, as was the modernization of storefronts. Well, I, I've got to get busy here again. I'll never get this place cleaned up. Oh, here's a picture of the Grand Coulee Dam. I want you to see that. That's the largest masonry structure ever erected by man. It, of course, didn't look like that in the 30s. Instead, it was a maze of trestles, cranes, and concrete buckets. And it was but one of the giant dams that the Bureau of Reclamation was building. Another dam under construction, which reached completion before Grand Coulee, was the Hoover Dam, designed to supply power to large west coast cities. You know, that power subject uh, was a thing that caused bitter opposition to the Tennessee Valley Authority, which constructed dams with Public Works Administration funds. Now, these dams supplied electricity, prevented floods that devastated the region, and in general resulted in a great many improvements to that part of the country. Uh, another part of the country was getting a facelifting. Here, a forest fire area is cleared by the young unemployed men of the Civilian Conservation Corps which put men to work in the national parks and forests. Well, during these first years when Roosevelt was president, he gained the confidence of millions of Americans. For the agencies that came into being meant not only employment for millions, but it meant new homes and better living conditions and a greater feeling of security for all. You'd think now, wouldn't you, with Roosevelt's program of reform, relief, and reconstruction, that everyone would be solidly behind him. But that wasn't the case. The press of the country was almost solidly against him. In the 1936 election, two out of three newspapers were against him editorially, and yet people voted him in so overwhelmingly. I guess it just was a case of where the people voted with the news columns instead of the editorials. You see, by 1936, most of our influential papers were part of the big chains which had survived the Depression. And it was the big papers that campaigned against Roosevelt. They didn't like parts of the newspaper code which came out in the NRA. And other things were happening too. The tastes of the public were changing our newspapers. The 30s were the years of the candid camera craze. Everyone was running around with a small camera, taking pictures of anything or anyone in sight, and the more unposed the better. Well, the newspapers couldn't fail to heed the signs, and the space given to pictures and to comics doubled during the 30 to 40 period. It was during these years, too, that Life magazine, first of the big picture news magazines, came out. This magazine, with its picture columns submitted by readers, its exciting documentary picture stories, was an instant success. There were plenty of interesting things to picture, too. Gangsterism was growing strong. Remember during the 20s, Bootlegging was the most profitable form of crime. Well, that changed, too. Now, kidnapping stories constantly filled the headlines. Remember that tragic kidnapping of the little Lindbergh baby? I think I have a picture of the a war, a reward poster here. Yes. Huh. Golly, how our headlines were filled with this sad story. And that was the period that John Dillinger, America's public enemy number one, was on the rampage. They got him in 1934. Well, our newspapers were full of stories of men who cashed in on the Depression jitters, too. Men like Huey Long and Gerald L. K. Smith and Father Coughlin. Now, these men were exploiting our need for security. Huey Long, with his Share Our Wealth program in the South, and Father Coughlin around the Detroit, Michigan area. The magic of radio made Father Coughlin famous. 
His radio voice was really magnificent, and he captured many fans through it, just as FDR did with his fireside chats. <coughs> Wait. Here's a picture, <coughs> picture of, of Smith and Father Coughlin. They made a good pair. Oh, look, coming in there, yes. That's, that's Dr. Francis E. Townsend. He came out in early 1934 with a method for ending the depression and helping the aged. His old age revolving pension plan provided that $200 should be paid to every deserving person over 60, provided they spent the money before the next payday. He thought that by keeping the money in circulation, prosperity would return. <coughs> the Townsend plan attracted a lot of support, especially among the older people whom the depression hit so pathetically and undoubtedly had much to do with the passage of the Social Security Act. And that was something just unheard of in 1935. Say, Howard, whose idea was this to clean up anyhow, yours or mine? All yours, my pet, all yours. Are you sorry now? Well, I certainly didn't intend to get myself so involved mm. here. Mm. Well... <sighs> What, what have we here? Where did you get them? Oh, well, I found them behind the winter clothes in the front bedroom closet. And there mm. are books of plays, just hundreds of them. Thank you for the succinct answer. Oh, you're quite welcome. Now, I'm going to sink myself into a comfortable chair. Well, it doesn't look like I'll sink into that one. No, nor that one. Oh, well... Clean off the couch, I guess. They can make a little room there. I don't know what I'm going to do with all these. <laughs> well, my dear, you'd better find a place for them or give them to somebody because they're not going to be back in that closet any longer. Well, let's see. Hey, volume three is missing. Oh, now, dear, don't get excited. It's upstairs. That's the one that has the history of the uh, Federal Theater Project in it, and I wanted to glance through it again. Oh, I see. Still nostalgic about the Federal Theater Project, are you? Well, now, Howard, you can't blame me. You know that year that I spent with it when we were living in San Francisco? Has a lot of memories for me. Federal Theater Project has a lot of memories for a lot of people. Yes, some 12,000, wasn't yeah. it? <laughs> 12,000 people put to work by the government through that uh, WPA program. I think I have some pictures here of this... Uh, some of these uh, things there. Well, Howard, you know, though, that really um, it was more than just uh, putting people to work. It was an appreciation, too, uh, showing people uh, the love of theater. You know, some of those people had never, ever seen a play. Oh, well, that's true. Well, you see, when the, uh, when the theater was first organized, it was intended to... Uh, uh, put on plays for CCC camps mm -hmm. and uh, Veterans Administration uh, uh, hospitals and so on. But uh, eventually some of them became so popular they were presented all over the country for a small fee. <laughs> oh, you know, when I get to thinking about it, we used to have an awful lot of fun doing some of those plays. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, Federal Theater Project was famous for the things that it would, uh, did, unusual things. You know, it would tackle things that commercial theater just wouldn't touch. Yes, well, now, here's, here's an example. Here's some of these pictures I want to show you. Now, here's one. That's from uh, Alice in Wonderland. That was presented in San Diego. And here we have the AAA plowed under. This particular scene shows the skyrocketing of the prices in the uh, sh Chicago wheat pits. And here we have some men painting uh, the scenery for a production. <laughs> You know, Howard, that's what made that seem so wonderful to me, that theater project. It gave work to actors and, and uh, stage directors and scenery designers and, well, a lot of people that had been out of work for months, Howard. You know, it always seemed kind of too bad to me that Congress voted to discontinue it in 1939. Yes, it was well on its way to being established as a national theater. You know, didn't they get a lot of... Uh, uh, protests from uh, professional actors that they were having jobs taken away from them. Oh, yes. But well, the professional actors' uh, worst days were over by 1935. 
Uh, but before that time, the professional theater was in a pretty bad place. Mm, yes, I remember. You know, two-thirds of the theaters in New York City were closed in 1931. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the producers had to pay huge salaries to hold their actors. <laughs> uh, Hollywood was luring them away already. Uh, were there any significant plays produced, though, at that time? Oh, yes. This was the uh, period of uh, uh, Clifford Odets. Oh, yes. And Maxwell Anderson had written Winter Set. And uh, Robert Sherwood was writing. Oh, did he produce his uh, Abe Lincoln in Illinois plays at that time? Yes, I believe so. And uh, uh, Petrified Forest and Idiot's Delight. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of uh, uh, musicals, too. Mm -hmm. the, uh, in fact, you know, uh, Of the I Sing, mm -hmm. written by Kaufman and Gershwin, was the first musical to win a Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> you know, that was sort of a political satire in music, wasn't it? Yes, indeed it was. And perhaps that's significant. You know, for the first time in 20th century drama, the successful plays were realistic plays based on social protest instead of this light uh, escape theater. You know, I'd like to escape myself. <laughs> Interesting as this is, but I've got some letters to write this morning. Howard, you're not going to leave this box here, are you? Oh, no, no, of course not. No, uh, I was just looking through some of my old film and find that I'm sadly lacking anything representative of the 1930 period. Oh. Well, uh, those movies were hard to get. Mm -hmm. You know how I remember them? The bank night. <laughs> and fortunately, I've long since broken the last dish that I got for attending. Well, that's good. It didn't last long anyway. <laughs> First thing, uh, uh, that's really what kept me going to the movies. Getting yes, no <laughs> doubt. Well, Howard, I, I, you can't blame me. After all, you can't do anything with just two or three dishes or... If you never match anything else, you might as well go and get the set. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, those bank nights were established way back there in the, in the late 30s when the industry sort of hit a, a bad slump. Mm -hmm. And that's when they brought out double features, too. See, the industry was trying to get people back into the theater. Oh, you know, how that talk sounds just like it could have been depression days. Well, what's the matter here? Oh, box getting a little heavy. Oh, well, put it down on the couch, dear. You, you need me to help No, me. no, it's all right. No, uh, sit down there again. Let's talk some more. You can write those letters a little later on. Now, what, what were you saying? Well, I had just said that I thought that these double features and bank nights, well, they could have been a part of the Depression. Well, no, because, you see, the Depression didn't hit the movie industry very hard. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they were too involved in approaching maturity. Oh, now, what do you mean approaching maturity? Oh, I know, don't tell me. Coming of sound. Precisely. And with that, the audiences had something more realistic to look at and to see. You know, all during the 1920s, the movies tried to escape from realism. But now, they, uh, uh, well, they, they kept showing the, the trend of society to not care what was going on or how far they had to go to have fun, that sort of thing. Well, you must admit that there was quite a difference in prosperity, too, at that time. Oh, yes. And people were becoming more social conscious about their problems, too. There's no doubt the uh, film audience was changing. Well, what did the, uh, the uh, ma uh, movie makers uh, do about it? The producers, well, they just changed the style of thing they were producing. Oh. See, the, the, these first realistic attitude was reflected in a group of gangster movies that came out. Mm -hmm. This, uh... I think it was James Cagney, wasn't he one that was... Well, yes, uh -huh. yes. He, he, was the, he was the guy that sort of personified the mm -hmm. leader of these tough him. gangs, you know. And then Hemingway, wasn't he riding that way, too? Hemingway and uh, uh, James T. Farrell. So, you know, if there, there's an interesting parallel between the business of making a hero out of these gangsters and the writings of those mm -hmm, two that's fellows. That's what I thought. Well, um, you know, Howard... Um, this literature is always interesting to discuss. <laughs> well, um, I just have to go and write those letters, though. Well, okay. Uh, say, before I go, maybe he's got a picture, though, to show me. Oh. Uh, gangster, uh, of uh -huh, those gangster uh -huh. movies? Yes. I Let's just happened to think about I think it. I have one here from the movie, yes, from the movie Scarface. Oh, yes, I remember. Uh-huh, that's gangster. That was just about the peak of this gangster racketeer era in the movies. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, that. Oh, say, now there, that's quite an extreme. The Three Little Pigs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Came out about the time that Roosevelt was pleading with the people to stick together and not give up hope during the Depression. Well, let's see another one. All right, see what we have here. Well, now, here's a good one. This is a documentary mm -hmm. uh, made by an independent firm, although the government made many factual films, too. Well, now, what is that one? 
Well, this one shows a terrified sharecropper, a man who was driven from farm to farm trying to find a decent piece of land. My goodness, but that, that really does uh, make a comment on the times. So. Oh, yes. Uh, there, was, there was another one, too. Uh, the plow that broke the plains. Mm -hmm. It showed the deterioration of the wheat country and the sorry plight of the people that lived there. Oh, do you have a picture of that? No, I, I don't have one of that, but here's, here's another good documentary. Here, mm -hmm. that's a scene from uh, uh, the film called The City, and it argues for city planning. Let's see. Oh, here's another Disney. Oh, yes. Yes, that is the first full-length cartoon film, oh. uh, animated film. Mm -hmm and uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. That was really a milestone in cartoon filmmaking. Well, you know, how you ought to do just the Snow White's doing there. You ought to dance yourself right over there to the files and, and file these away with the others now before they get lost. Well, maybe I better do just that little thing. <laughs> I've got some more nice ones coming, too, pretty soon to file with them. But, you know, um, during the 1930s, the films were commenting on many of the other social issues, too. Oh, such as? Oh, such as... Uh... uh Medicine. Well, uh, social medicine and child marriages and uh, uh, big business, ruthless big business in journalism and so mm -hmm. forth. Why, they were even making films on the anti-war sentiment. You know, that must be the time when President Roosevelt made that famous declaration of his, I hate war. Yes. Mm -hmm. In, I believe, 1936. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then in 1937 and 1938, when tensions were rising all over the world, the uh, movies changed from the anti-war sentiment and started making these romantic, patriotic uh, pictures. You know, uh, America took a very militant stand on the rise of fascism in Europe, and the movies followed suit and uh, took a firm stand, too. Well, then, too hard you remember, we did have information from newsreels. Wasn't that about the time that that um, March of Time film came out? Yes, about 1934, the mm -hmm. first ones. Now, those were the pictures that so very dramatically represented the world events and issues. They, they were quite the thing. I suppose they commented on the times more. <laughs> oh, definitely. See, they covered the whole field, the economic and the political as well as the social issues. Oh. Speaking of social issues, that reminds me that I'm going to bring this conversation to an abrupt close because I'll have social issues of my own if I don't get those letters written. Well, my family will literally disown me. Oh, well. I'll always be here, sweetheart. Oh, well, thank you, dear. <laughs> but, you know, I wouldn't think of leaving you with all these collector's items. But, hmm. Well, there never would anything be in place. Well, maybe you're right. They come to think of it, Howard, have you seen my fountain pen? Ah, speaking of things not in their place. Well, you may borrow mine. Thank you, you're a rascal. <laughs> but I forgot to say it. <laughs> well, <laughs> the movies and architecture weren't the only arts to be reflecting our turbulent 30s. Artists were painting American scenes as never before, and they were spurred on by the work of three men. Out of the Midwest, like a clap of thunder, came Thomas Hart Benton, Grant Wood, and John Stuart Curry. They marked the beginning of American regional painting and was a true revolt. Now, this was the start of American art coming from and of the people. I'd like to show you some of their paintings here. Thomas Benton, uh, he wanted to know America firsthand. And he traveled the South and the West, and especially in his native Missouri and along the Mississippi. Here, he's plowing it under shows a Negro and his mule at work in the fields at man's ancient task of cultivating the soil. And his jealous lover of Lone Green Valley shows a Missouri farmer who has just stabbed his sweetheart. Grant Wood's American Gothic won an important prize for its sympathetic satire of the American farmer. And his dinner for threshers is a regular occurrence in Woods Native, Iowa. And John Stuart Curry, in his tornado over Kansas, paints of the common fear of man and beast of nature's destructive forces. And in the Mississippi, he puts into the faces of people made homeless by floods the anguish and emptiness they feel within them. So all over America during the 30s, 
Artists were deserting their ivory towers and returning to the factories and the streets and the fields. Alexander Hogue painted the desolate fields of the Great Dust Bowl, just as John Steinbeck was to write about them later in his Grapes of Wrath. And the loneliness of metropolitan elevated platforms was re revealed in Aaron Borod's Oak Street Platform. And Reginald Marsh found his most characteristic subjects in the lusty, sensual life of our cities. And well, at the same time that some of our artists were painting the American scene, others were showing the effects of living with the Depression. Paint was their weapon, and they fought a system that bred depressions by making fun of that system, sometimes gently, sometimes viciously. And the Sawyer brothers explored every element of life among the city's poor. In Isaac Sawyer's employment agency, you can see his understanding of the subject. And William Gropper is one of the top social protest painters of the country. His masterful, The Senate, is among the best of modern satirical paintings. But this wasn't all that was happening in the art field during the 30s. Something else happened that caused uh, the greatest transformation in its history. And that something, again, was government. The New Deal stepped in to become the world's greatest art patron. It established the Federal Arts Project. It commissioned artists to paint murals in public buildings. It established art centers and classes in arts. It paid for paintings by American artists to hang in federal buildings. And it encouraged young people just coming out of art school in a depression-ridden world to stick by their art. Now, this painting by Reginald Marsh, Sorting Mail, was painted directly on the wet plaster of a federal post office as it was being built. And George Biddle's The Tenement was part of a series of frescoes painted on the walls of the Department of Justice building. Well, I'm just never going to get this place cleaned up. Here I started out with perfectly good intentions, then I got so interested in these things and the story they tell, well, things are in just as big a mess as they were when I started. So, I must get to work to do call in again.